it's now six and everyone looks like everyone who's coming in this evening will be here of the select board members. So I'd like to call the meeting to order uh, the October 6th meeting of the Southampton Select Board. So we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Say the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge I allegiance why? to the flag, flag of the United, of the United States, States of America. America. One nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Why did you have to do that? Because you do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you think about all your, right. Your daughter, I'll, maybe I'll read you the should have. Pardon? Pursuant, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 and March 23rd order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Town of Southampton Select Board is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to view this meeting while in progress may do so by go to zoom.us forward slash join, hit join a meeting in the top right of your screen, type in the meeting ID 861-9486-8426, password 504644, Hit join. Please be sure to mute your device when joining in. Now, to join in video meeting with cell phone, you will need to download the Zoom app from the App Store. Call in telephone number is 646-558-8656. Or we're watching Public Access TV Charter, Spectrum Channel 191. In-person attendance and public comment at select board meetings will be suspended until further notice. If you email a written public comment before the scheduled select board meeting, it will be read at the, that select board meeting. If you email a written public comment after viewing something at a live televised select board meeting, it will be read at the next select board meeting. Please send your public comments via email to selectmen at townofsouthampton.org. Please note that all public comments must be within the requirements of the policy on public comments listed in the open time for the public on the select board agenda. Okay, thank you, Ed. And just want to introduce every, everyone um, on the select board. Chris Files is here, John Martin, Matt Rowland, and myself, Francine Tishman. As I mentioned earlier, our chair, Rini Grode, will not be with us this evening. Okay, I'd like to, anyone have an announcement they'd like to make? Anything you'd like to share? Just, uh, we should probably recognize Francine Jen Day for passing the uh, mass collector's exam. So she's now a certified mass municipal collector. So congratulations mm -hmm. to her. Yep. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. That's very good, thank you. Congratulations, Jen. Yep. Okay, I do have an announcement about early voting. I, I wanted to do it early in the meeting so it's because some people tune out after eight or nine o'clock at night. No. So I wanted to get this in front. But early voting begins Saturday, October 17th through Friday, October 30th. It includes Saturdays and Sundays. Weekday hours are going to be from 8.30 to 4 and weekends from 8.30 in the morning until 12.30 with the exception of Saturday, October 17th, where the hours will be 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. because we have a special town meeting that, that day in the morning, okay? Um, I don't expect everyone to remember that. I mean, check the website for all that info. That information is available there. And I would also like to remind everyone that the last day to register to vote is October 24th, okay? All right, next agenda item, the appointments and resignations. We have two, uh, Robin Richards, uh, the assistant treasurer collector um, is resigning. We're sorry to see Robin leave. She will be a loss to the department, but she is a town resident and a member of the uh, PPPB. So we'll still be seeing her. So we wish her the best of luck. Right. And then the second resignation that just came in, what, yesterday, I believe? 
It's been, a, it's been a long week already, and it's only Tuesday. But um, Vicki Mora, our town accountant, uh, resignation. She accepted the position as the city auditor for Westfield. I want to congratulate her on her new responsibilities and her promoted position. Uh, she will be missed, certainly, by her co-workers and residents. But she, too, is a town resident, so I'm sure we'll be seeing her again. Mm -hmm. Okay, do I have a, a, a motion to accept these resignations? So moved. Okay, that was Matt, second? It's all second. Okay, Chris is the second. Any discussion, anything anyone want to add? All right. oh, nice, nice job, Francine, on that. It's a great, great summary, and they, the, both of them will be very missed. Yeah, they will. Mm -hmm. But we'll see what more. All right. They, they both live in my neighborhood, so I have a chance of seeing them more than, than maybe some. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's take a take a vote, please, on acceptance. Roll Balls call. eye. Balls eye. Roland eye. And Tishman eye. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, moving on then to the reports, beginning select with the select board. Who would like to go first? I'll jump in, uh, make it short then if nobody else wants to. Uh, no meeting since last uh, select board meeting last week, but planning board is having a meeting tomorrow night at 7, and FinCom will meet again October 19th. And we have a head put together, I'm sure he'll go into it more, uh, the uh, special town meeting. We're having a committee meeting this Thursday at 930 at the Brickfield. Oh, good, good. All right. That is going. Thank you. Okay, next. Yeah, I've got a couple things. Um, Board of Assessors uh, met last week, uh, basically routine business there. Nothing um, outstanding to uh, report for anybody's attention. Uh, the Master Plan Implementation Committee also met uh, about four or five days ago and continued to look at some of the raw data from the community survey and started looking at some analysis and um, maybe doing a little bit of cross-tabbing on a couple of uh, responses to see if we can see any particular trends or whatever going on there. And what we're hoping to do is to put up um, basically the... I guess I'll call it a report, but it's essentially the responses. It'll be like pie graphs and things like that that show the responses to uh, the various questions and showing how many people answered the question and what their answers were kind of thing. So we're going to try and uh, get that ready and hopefully post it up on the website mm, probably by early next week, let's say. Uh, and we'll see if we can work out a way if people have questions about that. Um, we can maybe figure out a way for people to um, write in with some questions, but we will have a, a real presentation of those results uh, a bit later on, hopefully around the October 20th uh, select board meeting. But um, we're making some progress on that. Um, and then CONCOM met last night. Um, some routine business as usual, but as I must say I'm, I'm very impressed with the the new, the new blood that's joined CONCOM. We've got some new members and they're all uh, very engaged, very active, uh, willing to take on a lot of volunteer duties, get involved with more of the trails and marking of the trails, et cetera. So we've got some, uh, some good folks that I think will be trained up under Marla and Art's uh, tutelage. Uh, and probably the biggest news, uh, finally, uh, is that the Mass Trails Grant that they had applied for, gosh, I don't know, probably January-ish anyway, uh, has finally been awarded. It's a little bit less than um, what was asked for. I forget the actual amount that was asked for, but I think they uh, have been awarded $50,000, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they got the final federal approval, and that means that this will be not only for some of the cleanup of the Manhan Meadows area. Um, this is uh, over and above the 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 dead tree problem that we had before this is like rebuilding some of the bridges it's actually moving maybe some of the trails away from the the river banks it's maybe putting in some kiosks etc so there's some some work to be done a lot of work to be done to manage a, a federal uh, federally funded grant um, but at least we've got it and uh, there will be some volunteer opportunities coming up for businesses and or individuals because we have to have a, a certain percentage of the grant shown as volunteer volunteer as our 
equity part of the of the grant. So uh, anyway, great news on that. And thanks to Diana Fetterman, who put in a lot of time and effort uh, to really put all the paperwork together to get that grant submitted. Um, I think that's it for the moment on that one. Okay. Chris, could I just ask you, you said 5 not 1-5, 50. 50, 50, 5 yes. Okay. That's, that's too, it's great. Congratulations mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next, Matt. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm alive here. Okay, so the <clears throat> Hampshire Regional um, and, you know, for all of the, the five towns, they have an interim superintendent in place. He was at the last meeting. Seems excellent. Ton of experience. He formerly retired, I believe, from Gateway Regional, if that's correct. Is that not correct? Local, though. You're on mute. It's anyway. Yeah, it, was, it was another regional. I can't remember another regional, but it, it was, was local. Further north. Yeah. Um. Anyway, great guy, and um, and definitely knows his stuff, and I think had every intention of staying in retirement, but um, decided to put his uh, name in the um in the hat to try to help us out, and um, that's exactly what his intentions are. So he's going to help us out in the interim. He doesn't seem to be. Uh, going or jockeying for the the full time position, um, and is is um, very qualified, super nice guy, and um, and should should help lead us kind of through the you know the COVID uh, pandemic that we have right now, and until we can find a, a suitable long term replacement. But it's uh, it's nice to have um, somebody else at the helm and uh, a fresh face and a fresh look, um, and to try to keep everybody. Uh, organized um as far as other updates are concerned um norris norris is doing well they haven't met in a little bit they we have a meeting at the end of this month uh to continue the discussion towards the progression towards going back to school so far the hybrid's been going well um and the and and progressing towards going to kind of a more of a full-time in-person learning scenario seems to be going well as as well um it's being received well by the teachers, by the students. Um, it's being conducted in a safe way, um, and all in all, it's a, it's a, it's been successful, very successful at Norris. And um, Hampshire Regional took the same topic up at their last meeting and um, is putting together multiple different plans. Um, there's a lot of them, and and I think that the intentions of the committee will be to whittle a lot of those down to try to focus the um, attention on a on a uh, small handful of them towards um, getting students back more um, for in-person learning um, rather than remote. Um, and, and, you know, the obvious, I think the obvious um, thing that at both schools that's an obvious limitation is uh, not necessarily the classrooms and the in-school environment, but it's uh, a big limitation is the busing. Frankly, just being able to get um, the children there um, without having, you know, without having space and busing to be able to do that safely. So that's, that's kind of a limitation, but, um, two good meetings, everybody's uh, positive and working together. And, um, we seem to be heading in a, in a, in a better direction, um, and making incremental progress, which is good. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. I sat in on the, um, the interviews of the two candidates for the regional superintendent. I was very impressed with Michael Sullivan. Yeah. I'm so glad he got the position and accepted <clears throat> the position. I, I think, as you said, um, he has the experience to put the structure in the organization as we face not just COVID, but other organizational challenges as part of the school system. So that's great. Okay, then up to me. Um, I'm new to the PBBB. Um, they met on September 24th, and they approved two P PCFs, which we'll be voting on later tonight. Uh, the Water Commission participated in that meeting, and it was represented by Joe Slattery, who requested a COLA increase for the water superintendent, which had been voted down at the previous PBBB meeting. The increase, um, and I have to say this admittedly, maybe some of you others on the select board do, was un unbeknownst in the town budget it just you know it didn't it didn't stand out so the select board in putting forth uh, the budget did not approve any increases for any employees for whom 
um, an increase was not part of an existing collective bargaining agreement or employer contra employment contract. So what we did, uh, at least at this meeting, was voted to table um, you know, the request to reconsider the 2% COLA increase for the water superintendent until we could get information, more information about the authority of enterprise entities, because that's what the water um, commission is, and water department is, their ability to supersede the decisions of the select board. Uh, I spoke with Ed about it, and uh, according to his prior um, ruling or information we got from our attorneys several years ago, the decision of the select board is the one that stands. But still, I'd like to just check a little bit further. Ed, do you have any more information on that? No, I have not had a chance to uh, take okay. a look and go back through the records from two years ago, but I, I will over the next week. Okay, so that's that's still there. All right, the other uh, item that was addressed was the emergency management director. Uh, the, the job description was slightly revised to include a bachelor's degree in CPR, which was not part of the original job description. It was approved by the uh, PQB uh, at this recent meeting. The scoring for the position is temporarily on hold until we understand um, a little bit more. It was scored as a grade 12. The reference document that um, we've used up to now, it only goes up to up to grade six. So that was one question. And in, in another, how far we're going down this path, are we inadvertently creating a new position as opposed to, you know, a, a stipended temporary position? So we had some questions around that. We're going to look into that. And then finally, it was determined that the assistant assessor position could be posted um, without having to go through um, a PRF, uh, just simply because there are no changes to the job description which had been previously approved. The next PQB meeting is scheduled for October 22nd. And I also, my other next new assignment is community preservation and they're gonna meet uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. So I'll have more at our next meeting. And that's it for me. Oh, and and I, I, can, I can, Francine, I can answer the piece about the grade six and the grade 12. Mm -hmm. Because the grade six that we're used to dealing with lately is uh, from that Jacob study, mm -hmm. uh, which wasn't adopted by the town. The grade 12 uh, is part of the system that the PPB has used for grading and scoring the positions all along. Mm -hmm. so that, so that's that have, why yeah. there. Does that have any implications for the classification system that we used up till now, the Jacob system? Do we have to go back and look at those job descriptions? I mean, we, that's a haven't used the, we haven't used the Jacob system. Uh, okay. That was presented to the town about, I don't know, two and a half or three years ago mm -hmm. uh, before I got here, but it was never adapted by the never town. Adopted. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. And just for point of clarification, Gil Montague was the former, um, was where uh, Mike Sullivan retired from, Superintendent Gil Thank Montague you. Regional High. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, that's it on the select board <laughs> reports. Um, let's move on to um, the next item is the ad hoc grants committee update. Chris Files, please. Okay. Um, we met again uh, last week and um, spent time basically uh, trying to look at where we are with the first round of the CARES Act um, funding. I believe everybody's aware that we had an allocation, a uh, total allocation of about $540,000 for the town, and we chose to split that up into two two pots or two requests, if you will. Uh, and so the first amount of 200, about $223,000 uh, has been received and allocated uh, to various departments per the requests that had been compiled earlier on by Ed and Jerry and everybody else that was involved in that first round of things. Uh, we're still, I think, um, struggling a bit in terms of the spend down. Uh, and and Ed, Ed, feel free to correct me and jump in. But uh, I think people have been a little bit um, 
um, not not quite clear, perhaps, in terms of how they can go ahead and spend these funds and um, what they have to do to make it all happen. But um, I know Ed has reached out, and he can talk about that later, about um, meetings he's had with the, the main department heads. Um, I reached out to uh, the Council on Aging, the library, um, the Ag Commission, uh, and now in Matt's absence, I've reached out to Norris uh, and also to the Parks Commission, just trying to help them think through some of the items that they might uh, request as we go forward, because not only do we have this first round to spend down, but there is a new application for the rest of it due before the end of the month, end of October. Uh, and so we want to be able to get everything in and consolidated so that uh, I believe Select Board uh, expressed a desire to yeah, have a look at what was going to be submitted uh, and have a have a say about that. And so we are going to try and get it together, given our next meeting on October 20th, uh, to come together with at least some ideas of what, what people are requesting in the various departments so that we can be maybe ahead of time and get that application in um, by the 30th. Um, and... Um, I guess that's about it. We we do need, I think, if if we don't have it now, because I think we don't have, I don't see it on the agenda tonight, but I think for our next meeting, we definitely need to have a clear spend down report um, of what has actually been spent on this first tranche of money uh, so that we know where we stand on things. Uh, and then, um, like I say, I hope that the various departments are getting their ideas together for the the other needs that they have going forward all monies have to be spent by the end of december so it's not something that's going to be um continuing on well right now it's not continuing on we all know how things go it's quite possible that at some point in time the government could say oh gee well COVID is continuing therefore we're continuing too and this might actually extend beyond december but we cannot assume that at the present time and we have to plan for all the funds to be used by the end of december so especially with this kind of a late submission for the second round here getting the funds and then procuring things and getting them in hand by the end of december is going to be a mighty challenge um but at least people are are thinking outside the box a little bit and trying to figure out what they need um, so that we can hopefully have a plan together that really comprises uh the needs of, of the various uh, entities in town. So with that, I'll leave that and Ed, please pick up with whatever I'm missing or mis misstating here. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, Ed, we're up to the uh, town administrator report. Sure. Let's see. The special town meeting as a follow-up to the annual town meeting is scheduled for Saturday, October 17th at 10 a.m. at Labrie Field and, and will be held within the Ball Diamond area uh, again, just as it was uh, last time. Let's see. Uh, Lucy Dalton received information on an election grant, which was available for, from the Center for tech and civic, civic life and requested that I apply for it on her behalf. Uh, this grant is offered in recognition of extra costs for elections, uh, which are incurred due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The deadline for the grant applications was October 1st. Uh, I did submit on Lucy's behalf and we have been approved for a grant in the amount of $5,000 to be utilized uh, for our elections and registrations uh, costs. Um, let's see, at the last uh, select board meeting, um, it was requested that uh, I check on some fund balances and uh, I will report that the fund balance, the current fund balances for free cash are $20,205.15. The capital stabilization fund balance is currently $91,130.16. And the operational stabilization balance is currently $428,306.64. Then I'd like to... I'm sorry, the, the free cash that you're talking about is from last fiscal year. Correct. Okay. Uh, usually it would have disappeared as of July 1st, but uh, as uh, one of the legislative uh, 
approvals. Uh, because of COVID-19, it was allowed to be carried over um, this fiscal year uh, as, as a difference. Okay, good. Then uh, I'd like to remind our residents, residents that the water commissioners have put into place voluntary water restrictions, uh, a limit on all non-essential water use and no outdoor automatic sprinkler use between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. seven days a week. Um, B, please restrict outdoor water usage to no more than two days per week. We hope this will result in a reduction in water use. If not, uh, the water department will have to consider implementation of mandatory water restrictions. We thank you in advance for helping us conserve and protect our water supply. I'd also like to remind our residents and businesses that the Southampton Water Department will be conducting our Southwest Area Water System Flushing Program uh, starting on tomorrow, Wednesday, October 7th, and running through mid-November 2020. During this time, the Water Department will make every effort to minimize system disruption. However, you may experience pressure fluctuations and some discolored water during the flushing process. If discoloration occurs, running the cold water for a short duration should clear it up. If the problem persists, please feel free to contact the Water Department at 413-532-4249 or email watersuper at townofsouthampton.org. We apologize in advance for any inconvenience this may cause. The Water Department thanks you for your cooperation and understanding this important maintenance process. And then this is a little redundant, but uh, Marla Hank, Conservation Commission Chair, has let us know that they have received the federal approval needed, uh, and the Conservation Commission is receiving the Mass Trails grant in the amount of $50,000 uh, for trail improvements. Then upcoming select board meeting, September 22nd, Special town meeting October 17th at 10 a.m. at Labrie Field, and then select board meetings in October are to be determined. I mean, that should say November, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, are there any questions for Ed? All right. Wait, Ed, you were talking about having another meeting about uh, with the department heads on grant stuff for COVID? Are you going to try and do that, or? Yes, uh, and uh, I was going to report on that under the uh, oh, CARES sorry. Act, but it's actually going to end up being tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. Great. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Moving on to the next um, old business, we have um, 29 Cottage Avenue the request from the Board of Health to utilize our legal services. Ed, can you go into some explanation about that issue, please? Yes, the uh, select board had originally authorized uh, $1,000 uh, to be spent uh, with KP Law uh, to get this filed and take care of it in court. Uh, I can report as of today, um, KP Law did file uh, this in court, but they have spent approximately $1,500 to date, and they're anticipating um, $1,000. It might cost an, an, another $1,000 uh, to get through the court hearing and uh, any follow-up. Uh, so we would be looking for uh, an, an authorization of another $1,500 uh, for the Board of Health to utilize uh, our town council KP law uh, to keep this moving forward. But, but we can recover that money at the time of the sale of the property. Is that correct? We can put a lien on it. If, if, right. We would, uh, there would be a lien put on the property, and if it were ever to be sold, uh, the town would recuperate that money. Okay. Okay. And I forgot to bring it with me, but I believe that the court 
date has been set up. They're going to uh, allow it to be done by via Zoom, uh, which will be nice uh, because there won't be any travel costs for the attorneys. Uh, but uh, I believe it's set up. I'll, I'll double check, but I believe it's October 13th. Okay, good. Thank you. Now, Ed, did you let us know that? It'd be interesting just to tune into the Zoom meeting and see how the process works. Yeah, I will. De I will definitely follow up on that. Okay, so I'll make a motion. We add an additional fifteen hundred dollars to legal fees for the board of health to pursue the property. Okay, is there a second? A second? Yeah, I'll second it. Okay, thank you, Chris. So is that is there, Chris? Is, yes. Is there any more discussion? Okay, then let's call for a vote. Who's, who wants to go first? Roland. Uh, Roland, okay. Falls I. Martin I. And Fishman I. So it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, the next is 93 um, College Highway, something we've seen before, the purchase and sale agreement. Um, and there are three versions in our packet. And I was thinking if you could crosswalk us through versions two and three and explain the differences between the conditions that set by the town and the conditions set by the buyers in these proposed um, P&S. Okay? Okay. Basically, they're all in Section 2 of the Purchase and Sale Agreement. Uh -huh. And let's see if I can do this correctly. And uh, the uh, Randall and I had looked this over and asked if a couple of changes could be made in there and the way it was originally drafted it says seller shall reserve a drainage easement and originally it said substantially similar to and we asked to have substantially similar struck out and the word identical added in uh, two, and then this boarding is the same as it was to the drainage easement described in a deed dated November 2nd, 1978, recorded with the Hampshire Registry of Deeds in book 2066, page 237, and shown on a plan entitled Proposed Drainage Easement, Southampton, Massachusetts, dated October 18th, 1978, recorded with the Hampshire Registry of Deeds and Plan Book 109, page 81. Uh, we asked that the words, the town be added and provided, however, the town struck out, shall have an aff affirmative struck out so it reads, shall have an obligation to operate and maintain the drainage, add the word facilities and strike out easement, and then add in its reasonable discretion and in a manner similar to other such drainage facilities in the town. So add the word long as not to damage the premises being conveyed to the buyer. And if we cross walk that with what the um, buyer's purchase and sale says on that item. Sure. Because I uh, think this is, this is one of the major points. Yeah. Uh, yes. So what, let's see. What they asked to have struck out or added is add the easement shall include strike out the town, strike out provided however, the town shall have, shall have, and then back to an affirmative obligation add by the town to operate and maintain the drainage, well, 
Let me do this right. The easement shall include, we had asked to have the town provided, however, the town shall have struck out an affirmative obligation by the town to operate and maintain the drainage facilities. And, and then- and Before yeah. you go on, it looks like affirmative was struck out on my copy too. You, you left it in when you talk, so I just wanna make sure. Okay. Yeah, I've got such small print. You are correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're asking to have in its reasonable discretion and struck out, and then it would read in a manner similar to other such drainage facilities in the town. And strike out so long, and then back to as not to damage and add including but not limited to causing erosion on the premises being conveyed to the buyer and adding or neighboring land of the buyer, adding the seller shall fix any issue pertaining to the drainage facilities of the seller within 90 days of the buyer providing a professional opinion that the drainage facilities of the seller are causing erosion or damage to the premises or buyer's neighboring land. Continuing the addition, uh, adding of language. In addition, the seller shall not allow drainage caused or necessitated by future development of abutting and neighboring properties along College Highway to use the subject easement for their drainage. Continuing the addition, these provisions shall survive the closing and be incorporated with the terms of the easement. Continuing with the addition, this transaction is subject to buyer's review and approval of the drafted easement. So in, in layman's terms, this is talking about future responsibility of the town. Is that correct? That is after, correct. After the, after the sale of the property. After the sale of the property, you are correct. Okay. Um, does anyone have questions or comments? I guess my question is, did our legal see these changes? Yes, our, our legal has sent them along to, to me. I had some strong concerns about these changes. Uh, our highway superintendent, Randall Kemp, had some concerns about these changes. Um, I did re reach out to KP Law. Um, you know, what the town is obligated to do is to maintain, whether you call it the, you know, the easement, the drainage facility, what have you. Uh, which we were trying to do in our language, but anything else that is added, uh, you know, as, as far as, um, you know, adding the seller shall fix any issue pertaining to the drainage facilities of the seller within 90 days of buyer providing professional action that the drainage facilities of the seller are causing erosion or damage to this premises at the buyer's neighboring land. Uh, in addition, the seller shall not allow drainage caused or necessitated by future development of abutting and neighboring properties along College Highway uh, to use the subject easement for their drainage. Uh, that is all over and above what uh, the town would normally be required to do. Like I say, we are required to uh, maintain the drainage easement or the drainage facility um, and, and keep it in good condition. But anything else is over and above that. Can I just comment for a minute? Can you guys hear me? Sure. Go ahead, Cheryl. So, so Could you introduce yourself, please. I'm sorry. Sure, Cheryl Fletcher, 22 Gun Road. Um, so it, we didn't mean it to be that complicated. It was just to ensure that we're not right back in the same position we're in now. And when Bob spoke to Randall, he was trying, to, they reviewed um, the easement and certainly we don't have a problem with um, the, the um, easement Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm, I'm outside. Um, 
to have the easement similar to what it was. It's just that um, because the easement wasn't maintained over the years um, and we know that the town just didn't have the money. That's the whole, this is the whole reason why we wanted to assume ownership so that we can correct the problem down there. And so while we were asking for with the language on the affirmative action is to say that, you know, should something happen? And we are concerned about the further development that, and we know that there will be at some point, you know, further development along 10. We're just trying to figure out what do we do to not have increases and a significant increase in the volume of drainage off of 10 that potentially either the way it sits now, I mean, nothing's going to change. Randall has, you know, the town has said that um, the pipes have to stay the way they are. And, and so the wording of the easement wasn't to, you know, this is the same wording that was presented two weeks ago. And it just seems, it just doesn't seem like we're, we're making any progress. And it wasn't meant to be complicated. It was just to try to find in there that if there was a, um, future soil erosion or future damage to those, to that land or to the abutting piece, that we have something to say, hey, we need your help or, you know, what can we do to work this out? It really wasn't meant to be this complicated. And, you know, we haven't, so nothing's really been done in the last two weeks on the wording. Um, Mary Penny, I reached out to Mr. Gibson a week ago to see how it was going to be presented tonight because he said at the last meeting that he didn't like the wording. So, but there's no suggested wording. So again, it's going to be two more weeks and um, I just don't feel like we're getting anywhere on this. And that's all, that's the language that's in there. It was just to try to put a little bit of protection on the amount of water that potentially could come through there in the future. So, so Ed, let me ask, is our version a reflection of our lawyer's opinion of the proposed, of, of, of their new section here on the premises? Yes. And, and if you asked my opinion, it would be to go back to uh, have the purchase and sale language, what was in the version two previous to version three. Okay. And that's, that's their direction to us. No, that's, that's, that's my your, direction. Our, our legal, legal uh, town council uh, also is of that opinion. And that's reflected in, in version two. Is that what you're saying? Correct. So they've never had, have they had the two attorneys ever had a, a discussion on version three? Yes. To drive us up a compromise. Yes, and even today, Mary Penny, our attorney from Melnick Law Offices, reached out to KP and, and asked, is there a new, you know, did you folks revise it after the last meeting where Mr. Gibson said he didn't like it? And so what was being presented tonight? And KP told Mary Penny, the, the version that was being presented tonight was what, we, what was presented at the last meeting with you know, the affirmative action clause in there trying to at least have some protection on future water and on that, on going through that easement. So, so there has they have they've spoken about it. My understanding is at least twice now. How, how can we predict what future water looks like in the future? I mean, let, can we just address this as a board? Like, right. we have no idea what future water looks like. Do we? Also, building development. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we can't be opening up the town to liability on whatever. What, what is the definition of future water? Like, there's no definition <laughs> to that. That's an that's like an opinion or right. a but that's subjective why reasoning was. clause, which doesn't belong at all in any type of a legal document, in my opinion. Drainage is drainage. I 
mean, I, I think we need to take responsibility for the easement in, in, in that property, if you will. But the rest of it added in there, it just seems like it's such open-ended liability for the town. Yeah. In, in a sense, something like providing a professional opinion. And a professional opinion could be my buddy Joe, who's an engineer, who likes yeah. me, or your buddy Joe, who doesn't, you know? So I, I think it's too mushy and it has too much liability. I can see what the Fletchers are trying to do, and I understand that. So we need to have wording in there that you know, says that we're responsible for the easement. But beyond that, I guess I, I have a concern. Yeah, I do too. I do too. It opens up too much liability to the town and it's way too open-ended and it's not defined. None of the, none of that language is defined at all. Now, now, Cheryl, if I can ask a question, you weren't comfortable with the wording of us in option two where we're maintaining the easement? Um, well, the, the concern was that it hasn't been maintained over the last couple of years and that's why we're in the mess we're in. So I think if there, you know, that's why we, the, the wording was such that um, by saying an affirmative, um, you know, uh, if, if we felt like if there was a, we were trying to figure out a way to say if there's a problem or if we see something and we bring it to the town's attention, um, you know, we're not asking to repair because we know there's no money, but we just didn't, it hasn't been maintained for years so and again no one's fault it just it hasn't been maintained there's disagreements on who owns the pipes the drain the whole thing so that's why we're in the mess we're in so we're just trying to say um you know that the differences between the two were to, to at least have a little bit of teeth that we could come to the town and say you know we're concerned or something needs to be fixed or or something to to say that we know that that easement's important and it has to be in place and it's similar, but there was also disagreement about whether it is part of um, the actual purchase and sale or in the land, in the actual deed. And um, I, I guess the town would prefer that it only be on the purchase and sale and, and our attorney is saying then we wouldn't have any recourse if something happened again we just don't want it to be to have gone through all of this and then have you know have it have it not be not have the purpose of correcting all of that so the hope was that at the last meeting two weeks ago that there would have been recommended wording back because I'm, I am very concerned, and I already told Mr. Gibson this when I called him last week, on the legal fees. Because every time KP Law is consulted, you know, Melnick's Law is consulted too. Sorry, I'm still outside. Um, and so I, I am very concerned about the legals on both parts. I, I just feel like, you know, if there was recommended changes, why couldn't, you know, we just lost two weeks that it could have been proposed. So that's all. Um, yeah, but Cheryl, on the, the, to play devil's to play devil's advocate, I'm I'm a little bit concerned that that we're trying to draw up language that holds the town liable at some point in time in the future for water drainage that's been going on for eons there. I mean, it, it feels it. Well, there, there's part of this discussion that feels to me that you that 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 at some point in time in the future, um, Southampton is somehow going to be liable for any amount of water that's draining onto that property through a drainage easement that's been there for a while. That's how this kind this how this conversation seems to be going to me. And I just don't think that that's necessarily fair. Am I off base in that opinion and feeling that way? Yeah. Cause I don't think, no, cause we know, we know that the drainage, the easement has to stay in place. We know you're cutting out yeah you're, you're breaking cutting out you know we didn't say uh, you're cutting uh, out and i guess another concern is that easement runs under a state highway so the state can have exactly. an effect on that water right yeah. into the property yeah. that's exactly but all of this all of this verbiage detail and language is is, uh, is honestly putting the town more and more at risk and was never in there in the original language like i, I you know I don't, I don't know. Now, now, 
know, Cheryl, is it safe to assume once you own the property, it's going to be maintained a lot better than it's currently being maintained by the town, correct? Well, we can't do anything. Randall told Bob, uh, Randall and Bob have had several conversations about, you know, the pipe and what needs to be replaced and all that. So the engineers have designed, we're not touching anything because legally we can't because you're right, it runs under the road. So the solution is how do we incorporate what what the engineers have designed on our end for the water to come off and be displaced over those, you know, over that acreage. So in no way are we saying, you know, we can't take the water. We know we have to. We're just trying to come up with a good solution. And it's in no way um, trying to say we're going to come back at Southampton. Well, we're no, that's not like, let's just call this what it is. That's not entirely true. And I'm sorry to cut you off because what you're what you're essentially saying, and I, and I am trying to be and I am trying to argue here. But what you're saying is, is that at some point in time, somebody's going to be the judge of whether or not the water is equivalent to today's water for whatever reason that might be, and that somehow that the town is liable for any variation in water change there. And I'm just not sure that the town is at any point in time actually liable for any amount of water change there at all. I mean, that's purely based on development. And then you've got the whole Route 10 argument, which we don't even own. It's a state highway. I mean, there's, there's plenty of variables there that are not the town's responsibility, but yet it feels like the drafting of this contract is trying to um, hold the town more liable than it ever ever should be to the regard of various water changes that that may or may not occur there and i i just as a as an ambassador for the town i'm just not sure that i'm comfortable for that with that okay well that wasn't the intention the intention was really just to say you know that we'd like to if something were to happen down there that, that it's a relationship that we have to have with the town so that we could come and say, you know, this is working or this isn't working just as a, as a partnership. It's not meant, you know, we're not trying to hold someone's feet to the fire because, we, you know, we've been trying that for years and, and not getting anywhere. And so that's why we, you know, that's why we really felt the only way to put a corrective solution in there is to own it so that we can. So, you know, I'm happy to have... I, I just don't know how we, I mean, if you guys say, no, it's going to stay as option two, then I guess we have to make it, you know, go back to the attorney and say, you know, we either have to live with it or, or, or don't. So it's just, I don't hear any, you know, I, don't, I didn't hear anything back. And so that's what we were trying to, um, you know, the two attorneys, I think, are just kind of sitting there too. So I, I don't know that. And I know that, you know, uh, it's not, it wasn't meant the way to hold Southampton liable. The, the comment about the development is a concern because, you know, over the years that's contributed to, I understand your comment. I agree with you. You don't know what the future holds. It was just to be able to say at some point to have a relationship that if something happens down there again, that we can come and say, how do we solve it? Yeah, no, and I get that, Cheryl, and I and, and and I can sympathize to that. But but how how things mean and how they read are two different things. It's how That's it all. reads because when we're discussing this two decades, nobody cares about how it, what we meant. I mean, th that's kind of the reason why we're in this situation is g given that there's there's some people that believe that this land was supposed to be signed back over to you at the end of the tire dump fiasco, which we can't seem to find proof of, and there was a, a, probably a ton of meaning behind that at the time. So. Um, you know, the language is, is really all that matters to me um, in this. I, I understand the intentions here because you're here, but in a decade or in two, when nobody's sitting here, all we're going to have are the documents. Yeah. yeah. So the documents have to read right. And, you know, this board isn't charged with protecting the town. You're obviously charged with protecting yourself. So we've got to figure out a way to meet in the middle or, or go our separate ways, if, if that right. be the case, too. And I'm sorry that there hasn't been any conversation to kind of blend the language that we could both live with, as opposed to just throwing more, more documents at one another and maybe not having as many conversations. I, I know those conversations cost money, but, but so, does, so does all this, you know, all the paper that we're producing. Right. 
I think for me, in the end, like, I don't think it's the jurisdiction of this select board to be determining this language. And if I'm wrong, then somebody tell me, Ed. But I think that this is for the lawyers to figure out, and our lawyers should be protecting us uh, and the town, and their lawyers should be protecting them, which I'm sure that that's the case. And then that ultimately, if the lawyers can't reach an agreement, then this, then this deal is off. And, and uh, our lawyer is charged with protecting the town of Southampton, both in the near term and in the long term. And I'm, I'm not really sure, like, I'm not a legal expert, and I don't know anybody else on this board that is. So I'm not sure that we should be deciding this language in these meetings. I, I feel like it's totally inappropriate, honestly. I, I agree with you, Matt. That's why I'm asking. The lawyers are and we, the and we agree, too. And if the we, lawyers can't agree, then this deal's off. I mean, I, I hate to be so rude or, 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 or obtuse, but, like, that's the way it goes, right? I mean, if you can't come to an agreement, then the deal's off. So, so, Cheryl, you said if worse came to worse, we went back to uh, option two. Is that an agreeable option for you? Because I think, in general, that's something we would agree to since legal mm -hmm. has already right. agreed to it. Right. Um, I, I, I truthfully can't, uh, you know, I, I was listening to the changes. I'm out, I, I had to be outside, so I didn't have the differences between the documents. But I, I don't disagree with any of what you're saying. I agree with Matt. We're not legals either. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, I am not a lawyer. And so um, I agree that, you know, both lawyers, but I think both lawyers didn't have anything for the last two weeks to say, you know, how do we come to a compromise on this thing or figure out what will work? So, um, so that's why I just feel like it, you know, I, I don't disagree with that, that, the, that somehow there's a, a, a compromise between two and three that works. Um, I just don't want it to keep going, you know, another couple of weeks and then have another revision. And I, I was hoping that we would be there tonight, that they would have compromised and had something, but there wasn't, um, there wasn't any feedback. So, um, so that's all. I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I, I know nothing about all the, what's the difference between, you know, the easement. I, I guess my question to you, Cheryl, and, and to Ed is now, and I hate to say it this way, but between now and the next meeting, could we see one document that, two, that the two entities have agreed to for us to look at and, and be done with it? Because going back and forth and comparing the original to version one, to version two and three, yeah, uh, it, it's really, it's, it's above our grade level, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. And um, we really need to get some very clear direction. And as everybody said, we, at that point we will find out yes, it'll work or no, it won't and, and get it done one way or the other. That'd be great. And my, my suggestion, going off of what you said, is take version two, have our legal go back to Cheryl and Bob's legal and say, hey, here's where we are. If we can add a couple lines or two that reflect what they're trying to do, I think we can do that without compromising the town's ability going forward in the future, because this could open up and literally bankrupt the town if it went bad, right. you know? Right. I agree. And that was not, and that's certainly not the intent. Correct. So. We understand, yeah. Now you're doing uh, what you're, you're trying to do to protect yourselves. We understand that. So, and then on the last part of it, I just didn't know if um, Hackworth had received the right of first refusal, because as of last week, they hadn't. They have. They got it last week. And, and have they responded? Uh, Mr. Hackworth is going through that with uh, both his attorney and uh, surveyors. He, was, he wants to make sure where his uh, uh, property lines are. And so when, when might we have... I, I asked him if he could get back to us by, by next week. Is there a time frame on the first right of refusal that they have to respond to us? Yeah. There wasn't no. on the document. No. No. But, but Mr. Ha Mr. Hackworth has said he'll, he'll, he will get back to us by next week. So if we can have that as well as a approved copy by both legal consuls, that would be great by next meeting. Well, 
Let, let, let me just remind you that legal counsel can work on your behalf. There's no guarantee that the two legal counsels will come to an agreement. Uh, final wording is basically up to the select board to approve if they want to sign it or not. So it does come back to the select board. Well, that's okay. fine. It's got to be, it's gotta be it, that's got to be ironed out by the lawyers. Like, I, Ed, I mean, like, I, I hear you on that, and that's fine. But, like, I mean, we're not writing this language. That That's for the lawyers to write. We're, we're here to rubber stamp whatever it is that they come up with, not to write it. Right. And, I yeah, I agree with you, Matt. We have to go based on their guidance. So do we need a motion to get that going, or, or is that just a directive that we can give as a board to the TA? Well, I, I think we need to get a motion. We need to set the deadline, and we need to get moving and um, get, it, get, get it done one way or the other. But to continue to, you know, week after week, compare iterations of this agreement over and over again, the, the problem with a motion, as uh, just reflecting what Ed was saying, is legal is going to take their time to get it ironed out. So we can put a motion of two weeks, and whatever legal is going to do is going to do. If they may get it done in a week, they may get it done in three weeks, you know? So I, I would say that we just push and ask our legal to take uh, option two and see if they can add any additional information that will satisfy the Fletcher's uh, to do what they're trying to do to protect their interests and have it back to us by the next uh, select board meeting and also have the first right of refusal answered also. And I and I think I think that's a plan because I know tomorrow morning Mary Penning's going to ask me. So if I say to her, you know, the town is really leaning on legal two, so on the draft two for paragraph, for the easement paragraph, so how can we come up with a good compromise and it's i mean i think they reach each other pretty easily it was just as there was nothing in the last two weeks for a revision so okay so, okay well, this this puts some something on on the plate for each side to consider discuss and hopefully finalize sorry i had to be outside i know you That's can't okay. see me anymore okay Okay. So, thanks, a, thanks a lot. Okay, if the decision among, I mean, Chris, do you want to weigh in? Anybody, uh, you know, on whether or not we need a motion? I don't, think, I don't think we need a motion on this. I, I think our lawyers need to do their job and not be taskmastered by us. I mean, because any taskmastering by us uh, prohibits them from action. It has the ability okay. to hamstring their, their ability to do their job in an in a effective way. I mean, if we're tasking them to do something, and to find, to fit into a mold, then we're effectively, to a certain degree, taking away some of their... Well, I, I thought ability. we were asking them to attempt to come to some resolution in this, but ultimately, if their recommendation is it's a no-go because they can't agree, that would be what we would have to accept. So um, I wasn't trying to tell them they have to make it work. <laughs> we just need, yeah. to, we just need to, to, to know that, that they've they've tried to hammer this out and see where it takes us. But we need, I think for everybody's sake, we need to, you know, keep the pressure on so we can get to the, you know, cross the finish line. Yeah, I would, I would just simply say that we need to, you know, let them know that we'd like to see a compromise that makes sense and let this go forward so this land can be protected and improved. I mean, you know, otherwise it it's just going to be the way it is. So, but it has, it has to protect the interest of the town. Yes, the word compromise bothers me a little bit because sometimes compromises aren't aren't to be had, and and I don't mean to be rude here because I'd I'd love to see one if it can be if it can be had. But we've also gone multiple iterations of this, so at the end of the day, like continuing to compromise is just that. Like you end, you can end up compromising too much. Both sides can, right? And right. I and, and not knowing the legality of all of this, like. I mean, this land has obviously been a thorn in the town side for a number of years. Like, let's just be honest about this. Like, there are compromises that are not worth making, right? And so we may be there. And, and, and for me, I don't want to instruct our attorneys to compromise any further. Whether they do or they don't, is up, I want it to be up to them. 
If they feel that they can, then they should. If they feel that they can't, then they need to get back to us and say that they can't. If we make a motion and tell them to compromise, then they're going to be compelled to feel like they need to compromise when, in fact, they might not want to. And so for me, I want to give them the freedom to basically be like, you're, we're paying you. You're here to protect the town. Mm-hmm. Are you protecting the town? And if you're mm-hmm. protecting the town and you can compromise, then go ahead. If you're protecting the town and you can't, then don't. And if, and if we can't strike a deal, then we can't strike a deal. I mean, that's, that's the way these things go. I mean, this so, is... I, I, okay, maybe I missed it. If I said compromise, it was to get no, them to come to terms that both sides could accept. Sure. However we, however we get. And if they can't, then it's their responsibility to say to us, it's not in your best interest to go forward with this. And that, but we have to have, I think, a final word on it. I agree with that. That I agree. Saying, we keep moving the goalpost. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right. So I guess the, the the consensus of the group is that we don't need a motion, but Ed, if you would get to the attorneys and if Cheryl talks to her attorney, Penny, and, yep. we, and they know that sometime in the course of the next two weeks, by that we would like to have them speak to one another and see what it is they can work out, if they can work out, and if they can't, we need to know that too. Cheryl's in dark mode. She must still be outside. I'm, I'm still here. I'm trying to walk across the street. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. You need to light up a pumpkin, I'm Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No, and we, and Bob and I definitely agree. Going back and forth is ridiculous. You folks have way more important things to talk about. And we need to resolve this thing because if, um, there and and it's just taking too long so um and, and i understand matt's concerns i really do so okay okay thanks all right lot. well thank you all right see you next meeting cheryl yeah okay thank you um anything any more discussion bye. on this thanks bye-bye ed anything more that you need from us no, I, th- I, I think I've got it is, you know, basically, you know, starting with the basis of option two, uh, is there a way to come to terms uh, that makes sense that still protects the town? Right. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Anyone, anything else on that before we move on? Okay, so we're going to go to the door grant, the energy, update the energy audit, Ed. Oh, sure. Uh, the, uh, the energy auditor that uh, works on behalf of Eversource was here uh, the beginning of last week. We went through the Norris School, the town hall, the fire department. Uh, the highway department, the police station, uh, and uh, the library. Uh, And uh, he took all his uh, notes from those. Uh, I have gotten him some of the energy bills for gas, electric, or uh, fuel oil. I do owe him a few more for um, some of those sites uh, to send along, but they will utilize those to identify any uh, projects which may save the town uh, energy and money uh, along the way um, and uh, that would uh, potentially be eligible for the uh, DOER Green Communities funding. And once we have those, like I say, that is a requirement that we send into uh, the DOER um, so that they have that baseline uh, to work against um, and, and go forward when we identify projects in uh, uh, these buildings. And uh, you know the the library he uh, he took uh, he he thought might have some energy savings in lighting, the police department because of the fact that even though it's open 24/7 that a lot of the lights are uh, off uh, for a good amount of the time that 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 may not be, uh, but he also took all the information on. Um, 
the uh, the whether the HVAC systems or uh, the boilers in the police department, uh, the library, um, and, and the highway department uh, for any potential savings that uh, may be there for upgrades. Is there some kind of timeline for us? Usually it'll take them, depending on what they start looking at in projects, it could take four to six weeks uh, because they will actually get their en engineers uh, involved with some of them to see if um, they make sense. Uh, and like I say, the, some of those uh, utility bills will uh, actually give them a lot of information uh, as to the square footage of the building, um, as to what uh, may make sense as far as uh, moving forward on certain projects that uh, would have good energy savings and meet the OER requirements. And how do they how do they take into consideration our participation in these? Um, whatever the natural resource savings things we're, we're part of a, a solar program right and uh whatever else we're getting rebates on some of this stuff right yes and, and that that is uh well that is actually part it's right on the uh the eversource bills uh so they will take that into consider consideration for the electrical portion Anyone have any other questions on this? So four to six weeks. So maybe we should put it on the November agenda. Sure. We are. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so if there's nothing else on that, let's go to the next topic, which is the special town meeting. And um, I'd just like to say that there's going to be an information session on all the Warren articles that's going to be conducted by their town moderator, Robert Droid and Ed Gibson on Thursday, uh, October 8th at six o'clock. And it's going to be broadcast live and recorded, but broadcast live on 191. So is there anything you want to add, Robert? Uh, I will go through the articles. I'll go through the procedures. The uh, thing, Robert Floyd wants the C six College Highway. Um, I need to figure out so we can share with everybody tonight because this is the last time our the select board audience at home will be uh, seeing everyone here uh, before the town meeting. Uh, are they bringing their chairs, or would chairs be provided? To the special town meeting? Yeah. It, it would be my recommend my recommendation that we stay with the uh, chairs being provided. Excellent. I totally agree. Uh, is it the same sound system company? It is. Um, we may not need quite as many microphones uh, to cover an area as we did last time. Uh, I think there'll be less people. Um, so that's one of the, tw essentially, I think from the annual town meeting, we've got a great game plan and basically map of the area where individuals and people or equipment may be, uh, you know, however, some of the uh, things that I see is probably don't need as many microphones. I definitely don't think we need as many uh, cordless or wireless microphones. Um, I've only ordered one handicapped uh, porta potty this time, uh, rather than than two. Um, other than that, let's see. I, I agree, yeah. and I, I like to hear. I'm glad we're, we're having this discussion, and everybody who was participating in the planning committee last time has set 
directions to apply to this special town meeting, so somewhat modular. So I expect we're going to provide everybody a very safe and concise meeting and get everybody out of there into their home safely. I thought about this actually might be more, but as I see it getting more chilly, I'm not so sure, uh, but more people will be around and there's less activities than mid-August, so we really don't know who's going to show up number-wise. Okay. Uh, Tammy has her hand up, and, and John, you're also on the committee, so you may want to wait. Sure. Tammy. We're, going to be meeting, we're going to be meeting on Thursday. I agree with Robert that I think we're just going to reiterate what we're going to be doing for this meeting, and uh, it'll go as, as smooth as the last one. Okay. Tammy Walunas, 298 College Highway. Um, we still have to have a quorum of 50 people, though, so we better have at least 50 people there. That's right. Yep. We can't get it adjusted like we did last time. Nope. That's so true. Thank you. Bring your whole family, Tammy. Yes. <laughs> which, which is why I want to beat the bushes and get word out to as many people as I can. And who knows what next year is going to provide. So it's a great opportunity. Nice full day. We're starting at 10. Um, give everybody time to get home for lunch. They can go then register to vote if they like. We're actually early voting, rather, in town hall. So it's a win-win day. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then and, and I, and I, would, I would recommend, just like it last time, that uh, one person from the select board, uh, whether it be a volunteer or whatever, uh, that just one person uh, reads the, uh, the motions for the seven or eight articles that are on the warrant. Okay. How come you all have been pointing to Matt right now on the screen? <laughs> uh, I'm looking for a volunteer. Who would like to volunteer? Before we recruit, who would like to volunteer? <laughs> I did it last time. <laughs> and you did a great job of it, too. Oh, I did. Oh, why, why, why ruin a good thing? <laughs> no there, aren't that many, there aren't that many of them. If, if you insist, I guess I couldn't. Uh, yeah. Couldn't refuse, but uh, yeah, I say if, if nobody volunteers, I'll do it. Yeah, just whatever. It and that's Good. all. Okay, I was going to suggest if we didn't have any volunteers that we uh, we kind of recruit Rini, but <laughs> 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 okay. So thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, so, so John will be John will be the warrant reader. All right, and then if I'm am I correct, uh, Ed, that the expenses associated with this meeting could be will be covered by the COVID money. I, I may be slightly prejudiced in this, but I believe that they should be because of the fact that, uh, you know, the first time around we uh, made the choice to limit the uh, number of articles on the agenda to try to keep it shorter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for, for the most part, every, to everything on here except one of these articles, uh, actually two of these articles, uh, are what was basically held up from that annual town meeting. So I would, make, I would definitely make the argument that this is COVID-19 related. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question for Robert? Sure. Robert, if we have a quorum of 55, let's say, and 10 leave during the meeting, does that automatically stop the voting or because we started with 50, it was okay? Good question, John. Uh, no, it does not. We could get it down to 30, still carry the meeting. Once we count and a count is announced and the A's and the an A's only total 45, we cannot continue unless we have five more. If somebody during the meeting calls the quorum, we have to do a physical count. But if we would to have less than 50 and nobody brings it to anybody's attention, we legally can continue to we dissolve. But a physical count would stop that if there was less than 50. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So it's very important that as many people as possible um, put on their their fall jackets and and come for and this this I would think is going to be relatively short given the number of okay. articles on uh, they're pretty straightforward so hopefully they wouldn't be exposed to 
chilly weather too long, and, and who knows, we might have a great weather day. So yeah. I'll keep and my Man crossed. Yeah. And Manchester's is having a going out of a business sale 50% off of foot warmers. <laughs> and I'm going to get some. <laughs> that trailer could be awfully cold. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be at basically an hour under. Yeah, I agree. Great. So maybe we could mention that to people that might be more of an incentive for people to come if they knew it wasn't going to be, you know, multiple hours. Great. And, and that's what we'll work toward, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else on that? Okay. Moving on to new business. Um, our first item under in that category is Halloween. So and, I'll, I'll let Ed share the information with you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just let you know that uh, Jerry Swanson and Ian Ellingsworth were working on a, uh, a draft of recommendations for Halloween and trick-or-treating. And uh, I'll just let you know that uh, our COVID-19 positive numbers uh, are starting to tick up a little bit here. Uh, so seeing that, um, Jerry wanted to wait a week before giving any, uh, shall we say, final uh, recommendation uh, rather than giving one now and finding out that, okay, in the next week, uh, perhaps due to uh, the situation or changing numbers that the recommendations have to change. Uh, so uh, she intends to get us um, something next week and it'll be ready for the select board meeting on the 20th. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I've been following it then in the news and you know Springfield already announced that they are not having any trick-or-treating the mayor announced that uh, East Hampton on the other hand um, announced that they were leaving it to parental discretion and then others then Northampton came out with a list of, of, of approved um, activities for trick-or-treaters and for you know, homeowners and for the parents of kids who are trick-or-treating. So it, it really is all over the map. And then hearing from Ed that the numbers may be uh, going up a little bit in Southampton, it may, uh, whatever, whatever that is in, in two weeks, will we'll figure into the recommendation at the Board of Health. And I, I appreciate the fact that they're, you know, that they're uh, attending to the, to the change and give us good direction. I mean, we have to rely on, on, on the source. So uh, a question, uh, say if the board votes for some reason not to allow door-to-door -door trick or treating, what real, what really can anybody do about it? I mean, you're going to arrest the trick or treaters if you see them going out there? Mm -hmm. Well, They're he is really, part of this it, conversation. I mean, so. I have a motion related to this at the moment, but I, I'm not sure if anybody's comfortable with it. I, so. Yeah, it's, and, and there's no real way to, shall we say, enforce whatever recommendations, suggestions, uh, or, you know, re requirements that, uh, whether it's the Board of Health, the Select Board, uh, you know, actually, you know, come out with, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, Francine's right. Right now it's all over the place. And, and a lot of it has to do with, uh, at least in my opinion of, okay, is that, you know, community a, a in in the red, the yellow, you know, the green uh, at at this particular time. Um, a good amount of the communities that actually have straightforward, uh, shall we say, banned uh, trick or treating events are much larger communities, and a good amount of those are actually red communities, you know, right now uh, that are seeing high numbers. So, um, you know, I, I, you know I, I will say right now that the community that I live in, West Springfield, is, is allowing trick-or-treating, but, you know, it, it's a green community, but it, it uh, you know, it, it is larger. So there's a lot of items that actually play into this. So I'm going to, I'm going to, 
I'm going to take some risk here because I am going to make a motion on this. I mean, in my eyes, and I'm glad that we've discussed this and I reviewed the minutes from the last meeting, and I'm happy to see that this is carrying on. But but it, at the end of the day, um, in my opinion, I would not be comfortable with pulling the plug on Halloween about 10 days before the holiday uh, for several reasons. Number one, it's not fair to the kids. It's not fair to the parents that prepare for this. If we can't figure this out in this meeting, um, I think that that's – I mean, honestly, I think all of it's unfair. That that also to say that I also just don't think that this is what it, within the select board's purview to be to be ruling on. We also saw uh, what the state did today. I just, I just, I honestly just don't think that we should be taking any action on this. And so I'm going to go ahead and make a motion that the select board take no action uh, with regard to Halloween. We leave it up to uh, individual people to take. Um, personal precautions, participate in the holiday if they'd like to, and continue to encourage um, what the CDC, what the Board of Health, um, what, what everybody recommends with regard to mask wearing and public gatherings and, uh, and gathering outdoors and limiting um, space between individuals and all of those recommended gatherings that we do and we've been participating in for, for months that we continue to adhere to those. And otherwise, if people want to participate in the holiday, they can. They can do so safely. This is an, The majority of this holiday is outside, and it's mm -hmm. for the kids, and they're wearing masks to begin with. And at the end of the day, like I'm not comfortable ruling on this on the 20th because regardless of what guidance we receive, and I'm, and I'm not trying to be arrogant about this, like parents and, 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 and people are preparing for this holiday now, at the end of the day, pulling the plug on this, if that's what we're thinking we might do on the 20th, is absurdly unfair, especially for a holiday that we shouldn't be ruling on. So my motion is, is that the select board rules for Southampton to take no action on this holiday and just to encourage, um, uh, and to, to encourage the things that we've been normally doing with regard to mass and distance and outdoor gathering space and to adhere to those guidelines. Um, and that's it. So that's my motion. Okay. Is there a second? A second for discussion. We had a lot of discussion in the motion itself. But there you go. <laughs> Kept it short, I guess. Okay. Not really, but. All right. Not at all. Okay, my feeling is, and, and I appreciate the fact that, you know, this decision being pushed down the line makes it less convenient and and you certainly don't want to disappoint kids at the very last minute but i do think that i see my responsibility on the select board is to go to the source of that can give us the best information and in our town about this topic we have to rely on the board of health and on the guidance that we get from the State Department of Public Health and the CDC. And if this is a, uh, a fluid situation where things may be changing, uh, I would hate to say yes and then find out later on that, um, you know, we may have put people unnecessarily in harm's way. I, I, I think that it's and, in our and not to say that the answer is going to be no, but the conditions under which it can happen may be set. But no, honestly, I disagree with that. We have we have asked them for their guidance, and they've and they have not provided it. We've asked them for the last two meetings, Francine. So just to be fair, we just haven't gotten any guidance. And so now at this point, I think, it, I think we should be comfortable ruling on this. And honestly, ruling on this means to some, sometimes our decisions are to take no action because honestly, this isn't the place for the government. If people, people aren't forced to participate in this holiday. If you don't want to participate in it, put a sign on your door, turn your light off, do what everybody does during the holiday when they don't want to participate on any other given year. If you want to put a sign up on your door, then go ahead. If you don't, just simply turn your coach light off and turn the lights off in your house and don't answer the door. Everybody gets the message. We've gotten it every other year. Um, if you do want to participate but feel unsafe, there's multiple ways to do that with trick-or-treating and putting out bags outside. I mean, at the end of the day, we've been living in this pandemic for six months. We have little to no viral transmission in our own town. We're going back to school safely. This is a child holiday. This is an outdoor activity. People, ha it's, I mean, th this couldn't be a safer holiday. And we have asked the Board of Health, respectfully, we have asked them, and they have not ruled on it in four weeks. And so for us, I don't think we should be ruling on it, which is the purpose of my motion. I think that we should, we should allow, we should follow 
if we're following anybody, follow East Hampton and leave it up um, and leave it up to the people, but just encourage the, the normal precautions that we take when we go to the grocery store. Um, I mean, it, it's, it seems re- very simple to me, but, you know, I, I, I think I we're overthinking it. I don't disagree that we shouldn't, this shouldn't be our decision, but we should make the information and the guidance available from the That's entity in the town that's responsible. And I agree mm-hmm. with you that it's taken much too long, but then to hear that the reason that we're not getting any, any information is the fact that the situation is changing, you know, makes me... So, so that's fine. So, so then we can issue we can we can issue a, 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 an information session on the twentieth. I still don't think we should be taking any action, regardless of what the information shows. Mm-hmm. Well, and if, if if the board of health and police are talking about this on an ongoing basis, and they come up with some some recommendations, can't they put up something before the twentieth? I mean, why do we have to wait until the twentieth? They they're totally they can act and post something, can they not, without our approval? I mean, the Board of Health, is that's what they're supposed to do, no? But, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I don't know that we have to wait until the 20th. If they decide next week that, you know, A, B, and C are good, but watch out for D, then at least let's put something out there. Oh, so Chris, I'm actually totally for that. I don't think that this is – I don't think that the select board should be getting involved in this one way, shape, or form. So, that, so you and I totally agree on that. If the police mm-hmm. and the Board of Health want to make a ruling on this, then they're – well and within their rights to be able yeah. to do so, it sounds. And I'm not sure why the select board's even taking this up, honestly. Okay. So that's why I made part. That's the other reason why I made the motion. And if this motion passes, in worst case scenario, the 20th comes and we are in dire straits. We can make another motion at that meeting, but you know, right now we're we're in a good place. You turn your lights off. I, I've seen on. Uh, on television or on YouTube where, you know, people take Hershey bars and put them on sticks outside and with a scientist take one so you distance. I think there's a lot of creative ways to do this and, and people are smart. You know, a little Superman mask with a mask over his mask, you know, the kids will protect themselves. You know? So I, the kids I, are the I, best at wearing masks. If, if you watch the kids and you pay attention to the kids, you tell like if, if, if you have a re- responsible adult with a kid who who believes in what we're trying to accomplish here, um, believes in science, you know, uh, the things that we're all trying to do here, and they're encouraging the kid to wear, like my kids wear their masks, and they put them over their noses, and they don't mess around, and they wear them the entire time that they're in practice or at a playground, and I don't need to continually tell them, can you put your mask back on? They just do it. Um, The kids are the, the in my opinion, the kids are the most compliant with mask wearing, but um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. More discussion? Okay, so we have a motion and a second. I'll call for a vote. Roland, aye. Fowles, aye. Martin, aye. Fishman, aye. So it's unanimous that we will not, not, not take a position on it, that we will um we will um you know uh, just take no action yeah yeah, we'll... yeah no not take any action but we will you know wait, wait for the direction and the guidance from the board of health and the police and and put that out and we will repeat it at our next meeting and if need be if we have to come to a different decision next on the 20th based on the circumstances we will sure sounds okay. good all right, so that 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 gets us there. Thank you, everybody. All right, the next item then is uh, the CARES Act funding, an update on round one, and the spending balance. And I'll ask Ed to chime in on that one. Sure. And basically, they have opened up the uh, start of the application period for. Uh, what do you call it, round two, phase two, uh, which the deadline is October 31st. And uh, went over what was spent uh, basically from probably back in early April, late March to the current time. And currently we have spent about $50,000 in uh, 
COVID related uh, expenses. And of that, let's say I've got my sheet. Yeah, in fiscal year 20, there were $27,936.62 in expenses, uh, which were incurred uh, due to COVID-19 and $8,404.02 in wages. Uh, so far in fiscal year 21, uh, there is, well, there's fourteen thousand one hundred and twenty-seven dollars and forty-seven cents, plus another two hundred and seventy-five dollars that is currently being processed. And so far in twenty-one, uh, no wages uh, have been charged to uh, the COVID nineteen expenses. And uh, what I'm currently doing is trying to take the information that I've been sent by the different departments uh, and relay that into what, uh, if it is pertinent to what we requested from the CARES Act, uh, of a particular category and item that uh, that cost may uh, you know go to and and for example uh, basically the expenses that were incurred you know in the town hall uh, which in some of them cover the council of aging also total seventy six hundred and Seventy-five dollars. Uh, the library expenses um, to date have totaled two thousand eight hundred and forty-five dollars uh, and twenty-six cents. Um, Council on Aging has sent me what uh, they have uh, basically ordered or uh, incurred to date and what they still intend to uh, order uh, basically this calendar year before the end of the calendar year uh, is, is still needed and the items that they no longer need that uh, the funding can be used for other sources and then i'm going through um what john workman has sent me for the fire department and working that into the, the sheet to see exactly but just in general and, and i and i know that some of these expenses uh even though they were incurred uh and would, would end, up, end up going to fema rather than under cares but just in general we have spent about $50,000 uh, in total. We can spend uh, about $500,000 depending on what categories it falls into. Uh, we've still got a, uh, a good ways to go. And there, and there are a lot of items that were requested in uh, phase one uh, that the departments still uh, intend to move forward on and uh, and add up significantly. Uh, Chief Fillingsworth still intends to go th forward with the uh, uh, re remote dispatch uh, equipment, which is $19,700. Uh, he also intends to go forward with uh, portable police radios, the UHF ones, uh, which are $17,771. Um, uh, under the police department was five tri-band portable radios, which were to be split between the police, the fire and the highway. Uh, those total $22,300. Um, say, uh, the, uh, the highway department had uh, put in and requested uh, some UHF portable radios for I think it was 4,000, let's say, find the right category. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was like $4,400 that was uh, included for theirs. Uh, and then the emergency management director had put in for some portable electronic signage. Uh, and we are in the process right now of moving forward with purchasing those. Uh, there's two of them. They're about $18,000. So uh, there's a good amount of money that uh, hasn't been spent to date, but uh, is in the works. And then uh, we do have a uh, meeting tomorrow uh, afternoon to get together and go over specifically what um, some departments had put in for that they may not be utilizing and also looking forward to uh, phase two um, of all putting our heads together uh, in a brainstorming session and uh, thinking about uh, what makes sense moving forward that uh, we may be able to move forward with in phase two uh, to utilize all the CARES Act funding. No, because the last thing. So I, I guess the question, I haven't been writing down all of these numbers to get to it, but are we going to at least approximate shortly the, the expenditure of the 223000 initial grant? Yeah, I'm in, the, I'm in the process of taking all this information and actually putting it next to, uh, shall we say, the requested approved amounts so we can see uh, which ones uh, have been spent, have been partially spent, uh, may not have been spent, but still, still intend to be spent, and what is uh, basically there's no intentions to move forward right now so that we can figure out uh, – where, where we are and how best to uh, reallocate those funds. And you, you'll give that information to the grant committee so they'll know of how much of the balance or more that they can yeah, well, uh, submit for? Yeah, I can, I, can, well, I can provide that both to the grant committee and the select board. Okay. Yeah, Ed, Ed's going to end up compiling it for the grant committee anyway, because he's going to end up doing the application, right? <laughs> We're just trying to be of help. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> since, I've, since I've already got some experience with breaking that, this stuff back down into the different categories and, and applying it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, just, a, just a, a point, I think as we go forward, you know, I mean, I think we've, I don't know if we've got any reporting that has to happen now back on the money that we've actually received, but, you know, I think there was some money in there for those that are doing the reporting to be compensated for that extra time to do the reporting. So I would like to see that we put something aside during this month, at least for Vicki to do some sort of reporting that she should do before she departs. And then we need to figure out a plan of who's going to take on the reporting on the finances of this going forward. So. Yeah, I, 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 and a lot of money. The, I would say that whoever the accountant is should have that responsibility and should not be rest with, you know, Ed or you know any any other department yeah. head. Yeah, yeah, but but I, I think there was there was you know funding specifically allowable for somebody to be compensated for their reporting. So to the extent we have to catch up and do anything before Vicky leaves, I would just like to make a recommendation that we allow that to happen and, and compensate her accordingly. I, I, I think I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Everybody else on board with that? That's a good recommendation. I mean, because I don't know if there's gonna be a hiatus between Vicki's leaving and having someone replace her and we have to have the information as current and as accurate as we can get it, especially yes. reporting back. I guess my question is compensating her extra to do the work. If she's doing it during normal business hours, that's just part of normal compensation. But if she does it outside of business hours, I'd consider that. Well, I yeah, mean, no. I don't, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chris. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I see this over and above. I mean, she does accounting all day. This is a now something in addition that she is responsible for in addition to what we what she normally is normally is on her workload right but i 
guess, it, depending on the time frame, it's during normal hours that she works. Like we all know, we have a job, we get new projects, new, uh, you know, that are different than what we have. So I agree, as long as it's outside her normal okay. hours, that's mm -hmm. fine. I mean, so maybe it's, you know, part of a day on a Friday. I mean, I have no idea, but I, all I'm saying is that I think it in the grant itself, it allows specifically for the reporting person to be compensated. Yeah, I think what we could do if she did it during regular hours is we take that amount of hours and apply that towards the CARES funding. And so either way, we should get reimbursed for it, Chris, is what you're saying, right? I think so. I, mean, I agree, yeah. yeah. Ed, is that how you understood it? Uh, I'd have to go back and, and 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 look at the parameters. My my original understanding was that basically, if you know someone to, was to work over their normal hours to you know do something, you know whether it happened to be you know reporting. Uh, you know, cover for someone else in the police department or dispatch or um, or fire that that was eligible. Um, you know, if the, if there was overtime that had to be paid uh, again to you know fill in a shift that someone was you know out from COVID nineteen or or something like that, that became the eligible pieces. I'll go back and look at the uh, you know the original. Because potentially this could apply to a lot of people. It could. Should we, in light of these uh, vacancies, I don't know if we should back it up here a little bit. Should we be trying to post for these? Yeah, that's on the agenda a little bit later. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Not wasting two weeks. Right. Not wasting two weeks. Okay. All right. Other questions on the uh, CARES Act funding? Okay. Well, in a point of levity here, I'm sure at some point in this meeting, we will figure out a way to have a meeting this coming Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Won't we? I'm sure Don't that. make a motion, Matt. Don't make a motion. I will not, but I'm just waiting for it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, I'll back that up so we know we won't. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next item then is the COVID-19 update. And we got a little information from Ed about that. Um, yeah, and I, I will let you know that, that uh, you know, locally our numbers, and I was just told this today, that our numbers for uh, positives are uh, starting to climb again they have been stagnant for probably i don't know at least three or four weeks um so uh we are seeing that um currently as far as uh fire and ems and our police and dispatch uh, everyone is currently healthy uh, they have a good supply of you know ppe uh at this time going uh for going forward uh you know so we are in good shape as far as that goes the uh the state as of monday has moved into uh another I think it's phase two of phase three, and I can't keep the keep them all straight now uh, of moving forward. And uh, you know the pieces that have been uh, changing or approved, and in some cases um, we don't necessarily have in here in Southampton is, uh, you know, as, as far as, uh, you know, venues, uh, go, um, you know, such as theaters or entertainment. Uh, but there are some un underlying pieces that have also changed, which do affect our, uh, businesses as to the rules and regulations that, um, you know, go along with barbershops or, you know, salons or, 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 uh, or, or nail par parlors. They also affect, um, you know, restaurants uh, as far as their seating capacity um, goes. I think they're now allowed instead of six to have eight at a table. Um, they have opened up uh, restaurants which have bars for people to now be allowed to sit at the 
bar and have food as long as there's social distancing. There's no standing at that bar, and it does have to be an establishment that does have foods. So, um, you know, bars at this point in time are, are, are not allowed to uh, still to uh, to open up. Uh, so, um, and, you know, I, some of the rules and regulations for how golf courses operated uh, have, have changed. So, um, there are, you know, you see immediately what uh, businesses have been closed that are allowed to open up, but there's a lot of trickle down uh, rules and regulations that have changed for industries or businesses that have already been open that uh, are, are actually changing the parameters there also. Yeah, I, I'm curious, uh, could, do you know how this is being monitored in all of these types of establishments here in Southampton? It fall, falls under the, uh, the Board of Health. It's one of the, uh, shall we say, daunting tasks is because every time the uh, state comes out with these changes, um, the, the ones that I call the simple ones where you've got businesses that are open up that uh, weren't open before, those are very obvious. But each time they make these changes, some of those rules and regulations uh, that govern some of the businesses that have been operating have changed, and those all have to be gone through and disseminated and see what the adjustments or new allowances are in there and basically the board of health and the health department have to keep up with those but it does fall on uh fall on the health department uh, we do have a small health department they're doing the best we can as, as far as enforceability um you know i'm i'm told by both by the police department and the health department that um you know we have not to, uh, had uh, any complaints as far as uh, how businesses are op operating or that they're breaking the rules or the regulations. Mm -hmm. I, I just wondered if there was some kind of monitoring process, you know, not, not surveillance. I'm saying, you know, periodically checking in, especially when the rules change to make sure that people understand those changes and are following them. It's really more to be of assistance rather than be punitive. Um, yeah, they, that was yeah they, they are disseminating that information to the d different business sectors so that they uh, are aware of how they are allowed to change. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? You know, what, what I've been thinking about a little bit is the contact tracing and just wondering, uh, I know we can't have any information of people's names, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, a ballpark figure um, on, on that would kind of put things in context when we think about things like Halloween. You know, if we know we have X number of cases, but then we find out that there have been 300 contract, contact tracings going on in Southampton, that, that, that just gives us more information, I think, to, to, to consider not just for Halloween, but for our, for our own selves and for and for everyone else. I mean, who's concerned? Well, um, to that end, Ed, can you define what the uptick is in numbers? Yep. I have not seen anything definitive at this point in time, but uh, my understanding is that we may have uh, two or three more additional cases, or I shouldn't say, well, whether you say additional or new cases uh, in this past week. So the last number I heard was somewhere around 35. Total in six months. That's the, that, oh. Right. That's the last, last figure I've seen. Okay. Which was, would have been as, as of last week's report. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, I don't, I don't know if I just, uh, if anyone else thinks about this the way I do in terms of just wanting information. That's it's fine. I do, I do, I do too, but you know, we should be defining uptick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And as I said, perspective matters. Yeah. Yeah. And like getting some sense of the number of people who may have been exposed. Yep. They have it just exposed. That's mm -hmm. just more information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chris? No, I was going to say, I think that would be just good information to know just in terms of how how much is going on in the community. I mean, just to have a, a general idea. Again, no no names, no nothing or locations. But I mean, just, you know, if we've had three or four cases or two or three cases, then what does that mean in terms of the contact tracing that's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you don't want to give people a false sense of, you don't want to alarm people, but by the same token, you know, gee, it's really good here. I'm going to relax, relax, relax. And then that puts us mm -hmm. in you know, on another path, maybe. Mm -hmm. that, that's my concern. And that's why I think having the information available makes people more aware and more conscious of, of the things that they're doing. It, it would for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and keep in mind with contract tracing, there are some interesting nuances to it. And, and this is probably a poor example, but let's just say that I tested positive for COVID-19. You as the select board are gonna know that because I'm going to be out of work for 14 days. But however, since I don't live in Southampton, I'm going to be reported in West Springfield. That West Springfield Board of Health is then going to do contract tracing off of the contact tracing off of that and contact the people that I've had direct contact with. But that's going to be done through West Springfield and not Southampton. So there are some little, like I say, weird peers, peer pieces that uh, I still don't totally you know, get or understand because of where people actually are. Right. But, and that was, but that was it, kind of... Yeah, I was going to say, but isn't our tracing is being done by South Hadley, right? So, I mean, they, if we've got somebody in Southampton, the person in South Hadley is going to be doing the tracing for those people that were maybe exposed, no? Well, if let's just say again, they were exposed to someone that does not live in Southampton then they are not going to be reported in the contract. No, 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 no. Contract. Okay, I understand that. But I'm, I'm just saying that we have an agreement somewhere with, with South Hadley to do our contact tracing. So they ought to be able to let us know to say, okay, yes, we've done this. And there's, you know, in general, I don't know, there, there's, there was, you know, very little contact. This person really didn't go anywhere and went to the grocery store once a week, but somehow came down with COVID. But, you know, their exposure to the rest of us has been minimal. And again, not not pointing at an individual, but just just in in general terms of, you know, this is this is somebody who maybe has had a lot of, um, um, what do I say, minimal exposure versus how many contacts somebody might have when they do the contact tracing. I'm not being very clear. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, you're correct. As as long as the exposure was a Southampton resident or the yeah. individual that tested positive was a Southampton resident. You're absolutely correct. But Yeah, but everybody puts their data into the same system, so it should be able to be analyzed based on, on place of residence. And so we would know how many people maybe not contacted by our person because they were contacted by someone who was infected in another town they were exposed to and then contacted by that town's board of health. Does that ever come back? Could we ever have access to that information? I don't think it works that way, but I'll find out for you. Okay. I mean, there is this central pool of data where they're all putting this information in. I think it should be, they could be able to tease it out based on place of residence. Yeah, we'll see. Anyway, all right. Okay. Anybody else, any questions on the COVID-19 update? And uh, again, I would, I would like to ask if we could have something on maybe the next meeting agenda about the contact tracing and the numbers and things that give us a little more information. Okay. I don't know if anybody else feels that way. Yeah, it's good idea to have a summary of the numbers to date and yeah. the numbers that exist currently. Right. You know, that's fair. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Okay, next item is the revenue and expense report as of September 24th. Uh, but as you can see, we only have the expense side, not the revenue side. People had a chance to go over it and have any questions, comments? Okay. In particular, it's 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 definitely more helpful when we have the revenue side to see where we are. So nothing nothing stood out for me this time. Okay. Yeah, the one I was interested in, Ed Ed resolved it when he gave his presentation on the CARES Act because there was money from 2020 already already spent, and that's how it figures in to get, to get a sense of where we are and our spend down of that of that grant. So that's good. All right. Um, next next item is the open space and recreation plan. I know that we have a final draft of the report from our consultant Ken Comia from PVPC, and I believe there's one outstanding section. Am I correct, Ed? Yes, and that's the ADA section which I'm working on. I've got that almost completed. Uh, I have some issues when I'm typing them up of formatting. So I'm going to have Judy help me with that so we can get that information to Ken for the end of the week. Uh, and once we send that along to PVPC, they will add it to uh, the draft plan. Uh, right now, my plan is to uh, do a presentation uh, of that and the process uh, at the uh, second CONCOM meeting of this month. Uh, and then I will also be uh, sending along and asking to attend a planning board meeting so I can do, and any other members of the OSRPU that want to attend and help me out through Zoom uh, for the planning board uh, uh, meeting because we'll be looking for their endorsement also and then uh, also be looking to get on an agenda for the select board and do the same okay so you think by october 31st yes it, the, the draft will be finalized and then you'll make your okay good yep. because this makes us then eligible to apply once this is plan is submitted and approved by the state, it makes us eligible for other funding. Is that correct? And, and actually, my understanding, even after we have submitted the uh, draft plan to them, uh, we will probably be eligible for that um, grant funding. Okay, good. All right. Well, we have to turn over every every stone. All right. Thank you, Ed. Um, You're welcome. Okay, the next item is the Municipal Preparedness Planning Grant. And yes, and I actually forgot to bring that information with me, but yes, this is the next one that we are working on uh, and uh, we'll need to put a, together a core group for the MP, MPV uh, grant and uh, move forward along those lines. It, uh, some of the departments and uh, entities that have been uh, involved in the OSRPU plan, uh, process, uh, whether those same people or um, some other volunteers from uh, those boards and committees uh, will be needed for this. It's basically the somewhat the same type of process as open space and recreation plan update uh, was. It incorporates uh, some uh, additional uh, departments along the way, um, but uh, we'll go through this. We'll basically develop uh, a plan which identifies some um, core needs or vulnerabilities. Um, there is outreach uh, to be done in a survey, uh, much like the open space did in the M uh, MPIC has done, uh, and uh, you know some reach out to the community through um, 
the hearing process um, and uh, going forward with that. So uh, this will be the next one that we do. The deadline to complete it is June 30th of 2021. Okay. Um, um, Trinity, yes. Could I have Cindy, Cindy Palmer. Cindy Palmer, 71 Glendale Road. A question for Ed about the MVP. Um, one question is, could there be at-large members from the community who have perhaps expertise in some of the areas? That's one question. Um, yeah, they're good. And I, like I say, I forgot to bring the listing of the core group, but yes, they do look for uh, individuals from the community. Okay. And the second question is, given that uh, the town is oh, in less than 12 months had two different surveys, the Master Plan Implementation Update Survey and also the OS, boy, all this alphabet soup, Open Space and Recreation <laughs> Plan Update, um, could, can any of that data be utilized without going back to the town for the MVP? You might not have the question, the answer right now, but I'm just don't want to get, you know, survey um, exhaustion for the town. Uh, just to keep that in mind. That's all. Yeah, no, I, I think some of that will flow over. However, we will have to do our own out, out, outreach as a requirement for it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Okay, moving on. The uh, Coming back to Ed, I'm, this is like the Ed show, but uh, coming back to him and giving us an update of the IT um, up, upgrades in Town Hall. Yes, and, and actually we did talk about this uh, last week. We had a uh, department head meeting uh, and we, it was one of the topics that was brought up. Um, we actually had talked about both uh, upgrading PCs and uh, the upgrade to the server. And uh, we're breaking that down into different parts. Um, the, fir uh, the first part that uh, we're moving forward with is I am meeting hopefully later this week. We're trying to set that meeting up with um, the department heads from the finance departments, accounting, assessors, um, treasurer, collectors, uh, office to um, put together a schedule uh, and also make a complete list of all the, the programs that uh, they utilize in, in those different departments to upgrade those PCs. Um, and uh, once that's done, hopefully we'll also uh, be able to meld in uh, the additional funding, which hopefully gets approved from the uh, special town meeting uh, and uh, move into upgrading uh, the PCs in those departments. Uh, and then lastly, while we're going through this uh, is figuring out a schedule um, in all the departments uh, of what their busy times are when they're sending out bills, when they might be uh, working on uh, the DLS gateway um, so that we know and have a schedule uh, for moving departments over um, either by groups or individually onto the new server. So um, that mm -hmm. process has um, started. Uh, like I say, there's two components of, uh, of both pieces, and that is uh, number one, getting a complete list uh, of the programs that are utilized on each computer in each department um, and what they, the current computers actually have for, um, shall we say, administrative names, uh, you know, for example, my uh, administrative assistant uh, has one that's named uh, for Kevin Toll, who I think was here three or four uh, administrative assistants before. And then I have to go to the server and correlate what that old information is uh, with how we would like it to be updated for the people that are now using uh, those PCs. So is this a new server 
server in, or are we just migrating, or updating data on the old server? I'm I'm a little confused by what you just said there. Sorry. No, two two, two different processes. Well, one is upgrading the PCs, uh, which will basically be done and tied to the old server, and then we're going to bring in the brand new server and migrate everybody over to that. And but the, by migrating to the new server can be it, not everybody has to come over at once. It can be done, um, you know, department by department, or you know, in, in this case, uh, if the, that those three offices with um, you know the finance PCs and maybe my own, um, once they're migrated, we may move them onto the new server and then gradually it's keep adding departments to it. Do we, do we have like a drop dead date when, when this can be over? So that, I mean, if you allow people to just do it whenever, whenever, if we don't put out a deadline and say, we would like to have this completed by to get it done. Well, I mean, there's nothing that should really put it, put it off more than a few months. So I would say by December 31st, we should have everything done and migrated over. It, it, it's just, like I say, you know, by schedule, uh, you know, I've, you know, one, one department has, you know, bills to send out, you know, during the, you know, second and third week of whether it's October or November, you, you know, you stay, stay away from them and you move on to another one. And, you know, it's, it's like when uh, we did the, um, you know, changed over some uh, items in the Council on Aging. Uh, uh, Joan asked me if we could stay away from the time period where they put their newsletter, uh, you know, together. You know, so, so there, there are some pieces that uh, you don't want to interrupt the workflow and you may be a little more... Uh, weary of losing information uh, that you've, you've started or you know, garnered, so yeah. So that would be some of the migration, but the actual new server, when, when are we taking delivery of that? Like I say, uh, one of the things that was identified, you know, last week is a lot of people wanted to upgrade their PCs uh, first. So that's where we're going down uh, that road right now. and. Like I say, I will I will work with the departments on not only the PC schedule, but uh, when what their schedules are is what they have coming forward. Of okay, can we move them over fairly immediately after the uh, uh, PCs are upgraded, or do we have to uh, wait a little bit? So, like I say, I'm looking to accomplish both by December 31st. And is this all Northeast IT that's doing this for us, or somebody else, or some of it's North? East IT and some, some of its CSS ventures. I, I thought Ed, that we had talked about this several times, and I thought September, beginning of September, the server was going to be up and going. Do we physically have the server? I thought it was on site for months because we weren't doing anything because of COVID. It wasn't on site. It's just that they uh, had were not doing any installations during COVID, um, and and for a long time they weren't just because of the fact that uh, offices were closed and people weren't there to move over. So, um, like I say, one of the preferences last week that, uh, our department heads uh, brought forward was they liked the thought of getting the PCs upgraded. Uh, and done first. And so who does that? Northeast? Yes. Okay. So is, is this in addition to what Northeast normally does and we have to have a special contract or something with them to do this or do we have well, anything? Yeah, anything, anything we, we don't have a contract with Northeast IT. So anything uh, or CSS Ventures. So anything we purchase for, through them as far as whether it's, um, you know, switches, uh, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, firewall, servers, PCs, uh, that is all done separately. So do they charge us by the hour then when they come over or how do they do that then if we don't have a contract? Yes. 
Correct. Wow. So they're like on retainer or something? Well, no, they, they just have an hourly fee. So if they're doing service, you're paying them by the hour. If you're, when we if you're, buying, the if you're buying equipment from them, uh, they'll, they'll give you a, a quote for the equipment and the estimated time to uh, install that. Okay. That, that was going to be my question. All right. Then I'm, I, I will add one thing. And I, the reason I'm asking Ed, and, and I think I might have looked at the um, the um, warrant and the invoices today before you had a chance to see them yet, but if you would look at the Northeast IT one, because there looks to be a fixed fee on there, which I was querying Vicki, and she could not answer what the fixed fee was for. So if we don't have a contract with them, I don't understand how we can have a fixed fee. Well, that, I think what I would have to see what specifically you're referring to, yeah. uh, but I think as part of the CARES Act, uh, the uh, the Board of Health had some of their PCs updated uh, and uh, have uh, some backup done, and I think that's the fixed fee for the backup for the Board of Health for uh, their uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, okay. Well, there was no nothing right. to sort of explain that because it was on a different bill to upgrade somebody else's computer. So, so just, okay, and then just that, double check that, it when you see that, it. That's that, all. That, yeah, then that, that might not be. It may may be uh, some of the work that they have done. Uh, you know, whether it's <laughs> up, upgrading uh, or repairing a uh, a computer or replacing a computer. Like I said, I'll have to take a look and see what it is exactly because, you know, we, we get a number of bills from, from them. I don't know. I'd be looking at a contract. <laughs> anyway, okay. Anything else on the IT? Okay. Now we come to the item on posting the town accountant position. So we want to do that, obviously, without delay. And if the job description and responsibilities haven't changed, we should be able to go right to the posting. Am I right? I'll have to. Uh, I, my assumption is they have changed since Vicki started. Uh, so uh, we'll have to go through the PRF process. But what I might recommend to uh, the select board is that you authorize one of your members to work with me on uh, compiling a posting uh, so that we can include that with the PRF uh, to go to the PPPB and it'll be approved. And also does the select board wish to entertain the thought or, or the idea of uh, looking for both a temporary town accountant and a permanent town accountant. Hmm. I think we're going to need a temporary because of the time frame. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. One, you know, one thing that occurs. I'm trying to think. Maybe it was when I was first um, talking to the um, to the folks at PVPC about, or I went to a meeting or something. They have some sort of a um, PVPC kind of regional mutual accounting service, do they not? The towns are using or some towns use. I don't know if it's short term or not, but is that something we should think about or is that a, not a good deal for us? I can, I can look into that. I would still probably say move forward with posting okay. for a temporary. Uh -huh. I, know, okay. I know when bef before Hampshire Council of Governments uh, folded uh, that they ha had uh, some of those types of services, yeah. uh, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm yeah. not familiar with whether, yeah. whether, and if they do, of what specific areas uh, PVPC may have. Yeah, and I can't remember if it was just a short term to help fill in the gaps for various various towns that were facing situations like we are. Maybe I'm not sure. Yeah, so I mean, it could be that, or sometimes they will uh, have uh, an individual that they will uh, might 
different communities might, you know, maybe, maybe they only need a town accountant, you know, eight hours a week or whatever. So yeah. um, they'll, they'll go out and find, you know, two or three of those communities um, that that one person actually may, you know, work for, but they end up working, you know, 40 hours a week out of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, should we advertise for a full-time 40-hour-a-week Monday through Friday position? It seems like they're always behind the eight ball, and we've, we know what the salary is, so can we attract somebody for 40 hours at the current budgeted salary? Well, I, I, I don't know if you'll get anybody for 40 hours at the current budget salary that uh, we – may want to be honest with you and, and as far as i'm concerned i mean john's john's suggestion of getting someone as a, a temp until we find a perfect permanent candidate um my concern is that we have an opportunity for that individual to have some overlap time with vicky i mean she can't come in and, and fill an empty seat uh with with no one there to kind of orient her and I think that would be a critical overlap that needs to be considered so and that and then you know then then we have to worry when we get a permanent in who's going to do that transition I mean we're like handing off so I don't know what the best way to go I, I think three weeks is very hard to find a permanent candidate and we may have to settle for a temp but we're going to have to do this twice then this this kind of transition you know i'd, I'd rather have a temp in a little longer and find a well qualified yeah. permanent yeah yeah agree okay matt do you want to weigh in on that i totally agree with that temp and then a high qualified permanent okay it's been thoroughly vetted yes all right. Do we have to take any action on this? Yeah, I would recommend that the board uh, make a uh, motion to allow one of its members, whether you know that be John or somebody else, to work with me. Uh, and you know, the direction of do you want to go through? Uh, Start start the process with a PRF for you know a temp and a permanent and uh, develop a uh, a posting for both of those so we can move forward uh, and st start the PPB process on both of those. Somebody want to make a motion? Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion that the board allow me to work with it. <laughs> on a temporary and permanent uh, accountant position and report back to the board. Okay. Second. All right. Any more discussion? And do we have to wait for the next PQB meeting to start this whole process, though? I mean, do, we can't... Uh, I mean, if they don't meet for a couple of weeks, then we won't have any overlap, really, with Vicki. And they're not meeting until the 22nd. Yeah. So, so we what, should be able to go out with a temporary emergency position, 12-week right. emergency position. Okay. That's what I was hoping. That was what I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Then, you yeah, know, I would modify that, that motion to include an, uh, an emergency hire if we find someone who's qualified for the temporary position. Okay. Do we have a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. That's Chris. Chris? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay, it's an important position to fill. Uh, it's not one that can lay vacant. So uh, just, I appreciate you, John, stepping up. Thank you. All right, all in favor? Files aye. Roll in there. Martin aye. Fishman aye. Yeah, can you. you just give me a call tomorrow? We can set up time. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we're down to coming down to the finish line a little bit. Um, is there any other necessary business that can't not, that cannot await our next, to our next meeting? Okay, hearing none, 
let us move on to the uh, PCFs that we have before us. One for uh, Timothy O'Keefe as a firefighter paramedic, part-time, non-benefited position. And for Eileen Hamill, an elections worker, um, part-time, non-benefited. Those are in your, your packet. If you had a chance to take a look at them and have any questions, comments, or do you want to go straight to a motion to approve one or both of those? I'd make a motion to, to approve uh, both PCFs for Timothy O'Keefe and Eileen Hamill. Okay. Second? Second. Okay. John is second. Any more discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Falls aye. Roland aye. Tishman aye. Okay. All right. There are no licenses. Next, Chris. Reading the warrant. Gee, I get to do it instead of you, Francine. <laughs> You'll do it much better. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, the first, uh, we have two warrants. One is a payroll warrant, P2114, in the amount of $287,902.89. And the second is the payroll deductions warrant, PD2114, in the amount of $46,190.86. Okay, thank you. You have all that in, um, detail in your packet as well. Thanks. Okay, we do have to sign off on two warrants regarding the state election and the presidential election that are in your packet. Um, Ed, do I need to run through each of the positions on each warrant? No. Okay. Good. All right. Okay, do we have a motion to approve um, one or both of those? A motion we approve both warrants. All right, is there a second? Second. Okay, Matt, a second. Okay, any, any discussion? Okay, it is what it is. All right, um, all those in favor? Falls I. Roland I. Martin I. And Tishman I. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're up to the minutes of July 9th. So if you had a chance to review them. Yeah, I thought they were complete. They were good. Good. Okay. Is that a motion, Chris? <laughs> I can make it one. Sure. I, I move that we uh, we approve the minutes of July 9th. Okay. All right. A second. Second. All right, Matt. Thank you. Yeah. Any, any discussion, comments? All right. With none, let's go to a vote. Falls I. Roland I. Tishman I. We're an agreeable group, unanimous on every vote tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, we have some pending items, whether or not we have updates. Um, Ed, on dog complaints on White Loaf? Uh, no, the only one I'd have an update on would be the short term and long term. Uh, disability uh, that uh, RFP is out and available and uh, we have had uh, two vendors actually already reach out uh, uh, on that particular item. That's two more than we had before. That's great. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, you know, we've been carrying these same things. Should we make decisions? Are we going to keep them on the list? Or are we going to update them or move them off? We can think about it. That's not for tonight, but yeah. let's think about where we are on each of these. Well, we definitely need to do the boundary on Clearwater. Absolutely. Yes, yes. that we need. All right. Thank you. All right, then moving on to the next item is the calendar and the announcements. We know our next select board meeting is so far, Matt, next one is October 20th, <laughs> not next week, October 20th. 
Yeah. I'll make a motion. We have one next Tuesday. No. Yeah. <laughs> Second. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, and then. I um, rescind the motion. <laughs> me too. Thank you. And I have a second to rescind as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, these November um, meetings. Do you want to wait until Rini's back before we set that calendar? Or are you comfortable going ahead? I'm good. I think we're on cycle again every two weeks, anyways. Okay. So let's look at November. And uh, Ed, do you have some dates in mind, or? Oh, well, the third. The first. The first one that would pop up is going to be the uh, uh, national election day. So that's not, that wouldn't be good. Yeah, so, so uh, just a question. So let's not so have just one for the 17th. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so it's just a question if the board wants to meet another day that particular week, like the Wednesday or the Thursday, uh, or well, you skip the whole week and go another week. Why don't we go to the 10th and go from there? I, I would, all the way to the 17th. Well, I think that's way, that's way too far, and especially if we have positions to fill and so forth. So yeah. I, I, I like your thought, Matt, but I don't think so. we can go that far. <laughs> wow. I know. So, um, now then we're way off track again. Yeah, I know. Um, so why don't we try to meet, I mean, in order to stay every, every two weeks, why don't we try to meet later in the week after the election, like the fourth or the fifth. And then come back on the 17th. So and then come back on the 17th and then we'll stay on track. Okay. All right. What's your preference? Uh, it depends what happens on the third. I was going to say the same thing, John. <laughs> Why can't we meet on Monday? Pardon? Why can't we meet on Monday the 2nd? That's an interesting idea. Um, Tammy, committee? Has a, Tammy has a... School committee, maybe? Or, no? That's okay. If, if, Tammy, do you have something? Can you unmute her? She's checking, I think. Yeah, she should be able to unmute herself. Yeah, she's looking at her calendar, I think. I don't know if we should schedule our meetings around Tammy, though. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. That's, That's funny. The, Matt, I just, because you are on Tammy Lunas 298 College Highway, because you are on there, um, you may want to be aware that we have been every two weeks for them our next one is october 13th because the 12th is the holiday so we would be meeting the 26th and then the 9th so yes. if you went the sec the second we would you would be okay okay the second for me is a con com meeting um okay which is well well scheduled ahead of time so i'd prefer to do it like the fourth or the fifth, frankly. Okay. Maybe the fifth. <laughs> Give us a day to recover, whatever it is. Okay. All right. Everybody, can we make the fifth? I'll All go right. for the, okay, so we'll pick November fifth, or yes, November fifth, and then next we'll come back to our Tuesday, which would be November seventeenth. Okay. And then after that, it would be we're into December. Okay. That works, I think. Yep. So the fifth and the seventeenth. Okay, good. Um, one more um, shout out for the special town meeting on October 17th at 10 a.m. at Labrie Field. Chairs will be provided. <laughs> um, just a, one, one more time for the people who may have joined late and missed the beginning. Uh, early voting starts on Saturday, uh, October 17th, ends on Friday, October 30th. Uh, the hours are posted on the town website. It's open weekdays as well as both weekend days during that time period. Okay. All right. Now we're up to open time for the public. And just add that we just reserve this portion of the meeting for public comment. Comments should not exceed more than five minutes. Do we have anyone who would like to make a comment there? Robert Floyd. Did I see Robert Floyd? 
Yeah, Robert Floyd, 166 College Highway. I would like to give my five minutes to Tammy Walunas, who will share news about the Historical Society's Cemetery Walk. Tamara Lunas, 298 College Highway, president for the Southampton Historical Society. We are um, putting together our first cemetery walk. It will be happening on Saturday, October 24th. Um, it's originally planned from 3 to 5 o'clock. Right now, um, the first, and it's groups of 10 people at a time every 20 minutes and right now the first two groups are full um so we're looking at 3 40 and four o'clock to fill up now um and we have i believe i think there's nine different historians that we're going to be talking about and we're you know it's a family friendly event wear your mask everybody's just going to be spaced out but you'll hear our speakers and um Get to see our lovely uh, cemetery. So, October October twenty fourth. It's a Saturday afternoon. And how do people sign up, Tammy? Um, they can either do it on the Southampton um, Facebook page, or if they have liked the Southampton Historical Society, they can actually do it on that and type in what hours they want, what okay. time segment. All right. Good. And we have um, some very interesting speakers that are going to be coming for us. And we have several um, kids from Hampshire Regional that are going to come down and, and do their community service for us. Um, it's a, our last event. Um, our speaker was fabulous, and we held it at the pavilion in the dark because um, we did not know that the lights were not working. No electricity was working down there. Um, it went very well, but our big thing right now is, and we're really pushing, is our um, historical, the cemetery walk. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Seeing none, that closes the uh, public comment section. Correspondence. I'm going to look to Ed. Besides the couple of resignation letters that we got that we've already been through, is there anything else? I've got two because I told the board about this one the last time, but I didn't have it with me to read. So it's from Donald and Paula Sikowski, uh, 86 Pomeroy Street, East Hampton, Mass., to whom it may concern. We own approximately 29 to 30 acres land in Southampton, which abuts Cook Road. We have been approached by builders interested in developing this land, but we would prefer to see it used as conservation land. It is over the aquifer, which would increase the protection of the water supply. If you are interested in purchasing this land, I would be happy to talk to you with you about it. The city of East Hampton might even be willing to help pay for the land. Very truly yours, Donald L. Sikowski, Sr. And uh, I did send that uh, copy of that along to the uh, the water department and water commissioners and uh, actually I know that the uh, the open space committee uh, is uh, aware of that uh, also and right. does Comcom need to be involved what's that and does the conservation committee need to be advised as well yeah, I suppose it wouldn't hurt. It's a good idea. I can do that. Yeah. The uh, open space has, has definitely been aware of it, and they've started some uh, discussions. I know they've um, talked a bit, not only with the water commissioner, but also uh, I think with somebody in East Hampton, perhaps. So there's they're aware of that. And then there is a member from uh, CONCOM on the open space committee. So hopefully that gets back and forth, but it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to share that, too, if they haven't already. Okay. Just a thought, as different committees are talking about it, thinking about it, et cetera, et cetera, if we don't get back to the owners and saying, we do have an interest, we're exploring it, can you give us a little time, they may think we're not interested and throw it on the market and uh, it's lost. So I would make a recommendation we get back to them and see if we could have some time to think this process through. Yeah, I agree. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, John. Good. All right. Um, okay. Then I've got one other, which is kind of like a follow-up. Um, and uh, back in the middle of September, Crystal Kane had uh, e emailed uh, to us, hi, I'm writing because I live for my whole life at Two Buchanan Circle and my beautiful view of woods across the street is town owned. I can't find it on public records and I have inquired many, many times over the years to see if it was possible for me to buy it and preserve it. I know it's not buildable and I'm happy for that. I just want to keep it so I can have it for the views and to have it as part of my property. Is it possible to sell it to me? Thank you so much. And she had sent the, uh, the property record card that she got from uh, Martha um, along with her email. And as you may remember, uh, uh, there's a little note on that property record card uh, in description that said conserve for conservation. Um, I had uh, Martha take a look at this. This was actually part of a tax title uh, piece. Uh, it was signed over to uh, the town and uh, Mar Martha actually looked up the deed because she felt that the little note on the property record card uh, was just s s someone's guess or note uh, at the time the, the town, it became town property. Um, we looked at the deed, there is no uh, reference in the deed that um, this should be, uh, for the conservation, for conservation purposes, deed restrictions, or anything else. So um, this would be one of those parcels that if the board wanted to um, proceed in disposing it uh, as a surplus property, they would have, uh, have to declare it as surplus property, uh, put it on a town meeting warrant to have it uh, moved over uh, from uh, the treasurer's responsibility to the select board's uh, responsibility uh, as far as disposing of it. Uh, and then it would be much the same uh, type of process as uh, we went through with the 93 uh, College Highway parcel that, um, you know, the board could um, go out and uh, whether it be uh, proposals, information for bid or auction. And was there anything on that card that said it was not buildable? Did you say that? I, I didn't catch it. Uh, I, hate take, I hate to take a property owner's word that it's not buildable or somebody who wants to buy the land, you know, because that could be a six figure mistake. How many acres was it again? What's that? How many acres was it again? How big was it? Uh, hang on a second. It's uh, 30,900 square feet. So. Less than that's under an acre. Under an acre. Well, that's under three quarters. But if it's a residential village, let's say, or something like that, you only need like 30,500 or 31,000 square feet to be a building lot. So that might be a legitimate size for a building lot. I don't know what the zoning is there. Yeah, it's, it says notes. The notes on here say tax title, December 7th, 2006. Not a building lot for planning board. But that's 2006. Have things changed in the last 14 years? I know yeah. perk tests, Title V, all those have changed in the last 14, 15 years. So again, so we don't make a you know a substantial mistake because that could be money that we could really use. So I'd really like to have all that information updated and explore whether it is a valid lot or not. And the assessed value. Assessed value. And that depends yeah. on whether it's a building lot or not. Yeah, twenty-one three. Yeah, twenty-one three is the assessed value. But yeah, I, I can see what I can find out on that, John. And I, I don't know if it's 
not a buildable lot due to size, uh, topography, yeah. you know, wetlands, whatever. But I'll see what I can find out. Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, I don't think it's top priority to get that information because, you know, it's, it's just sitting there right now since 2006. But, yeah, if we can get that information so we can make a decision, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. A any more discussion on that item? All right. How about anything else that we did not, it seems like we talked about a lot tonight. Anything we missed? Yeah. Okay. All right, then. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Matt? I'll second it. Okay. And Chris, Chris second. All right. Yes, Matt and Chris. All right, everybody. That's it. Thank you very much. We you gotta take are... a vote. You gotta take a vote. Oh yes, oh, I'm yep. sorry. <laughs> Call for Bell's vote. Eye. Bell's eye. <laughs> Mark and I. Tishman I. Okay, Matt. Matt is I. Okay, thank you. Yes, I was. Uh, I, I knew it was being the unanimous. I just thought we'd skip that part. But anyway, thank you very much. And it is 8.45 p.m. So we are completely under, under three hours. <laughs> Good job, friends. Thank you, thank you everybody. Have a good evening all. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye.